HP2, plug to Phoenix, Cowboy 2. Um, if you need help with your talk titles, go see someone else. <laughs> um, so, so let's talk about plug. Who's used plug? Show of hands. Okay, if you've used Phoenix, you've used plug, by the way, so, you know, show of hands again. <laughs> uh, okay, less people have used Phoenix. And, okay, fine. Um, I usually like to get the audience's, you know, level and then discard that and continue the talk I've already prepared. So um, there are two parts to plug. There's the specification for composable modules. Um, so that's what you'll hear referred to as a plug. So you'll get like a function plug or a module plug. Uh, and then there's the other part, which is the interface for web servers. So um, plug's adapter based, and there are loads of adapters available. There's a cowboy one. Um, <laughs> th there are others. Uh, I'll, I'll come on to it uh, later. Uh, and the, the other thing about Plug is that it supports a HTTP 1.1 feature set. So that means that it supports the options um, method and it supports chunking, but it doesn't support like WebSockets or HTTP 2 uh, and any of their features. Uh, so this is an example of a module plug. Uh, it's quite a simple one. Uh, if you can't read the code, if it's not big enough, there's heaps of space on the floor over there. So go and sit over there and you'll be able to see it better. Uh, <laughs> So the, the hello world plug, um, you add the um, behavior module attribute for plug, and it's quite common to import the plug.con, so you don't need to um, write out the fully qualified function name. You can just write you know, send response instead of plug.con.send response. And then um, plugs have an init function. Um, I'm using the Elixir 1.5 impl module attribute here that says that this function is an implementation of the callback for this particular module, the plug module. So that'll warn if for some reason the plug uh, behavior changes. Um, and the init function can be called at compile time as well. So uh, the options from init are passed in as the second argument to the call function. Um, and the call function, the first argument is a con, which is a struct. Um, it's a plug.construct, which has many fields that relate to HTTP requests. So you'll have things like headers in there. Um, you'll have like the response body, um, request headers, and, and so on. Um, so in this particular example, I'm taking the con, I'm setting the content type to text plain, and then sending a 200 with the, the string hello world. And that's probably the most basic plug that you'll, you'll see. Um, here's a slightly more advanced example. So it's called post finder, and the idea is maybe we've got um, a controller somewhere in Phoenix, and there are some, uh, like, you've got your show, your update, and your delete, for example, that all take that all require this um, resource to be available. So we'd pop this plug in at the top of the controller to call for all the actions that need it. And again, in it and call. And there's, let's assume there's a blog module somewhere that has a get post function. So we'll take the params. So this will either be body params, query string, or URL parameters. Um, in this case, it'll likely be the URL. And if the um, blog post is found, then we will assign it. So assign is a map of data that's available on a plug.con. And you can just put whatever you like in there, and it'll be available for subsequent plugs. So normally when you use plugs, you use them in a pipeline. So you'll start somewhere, you'll perform some sort of transformation on the con, um, and then eventually you'll return a con, and that'll be passed into the next one. Uh, the other thing that can happen here is you'll get an error, and the, the resource can't be found, in which case we'll send a 404 not found, and we'll halt the pipeline as well. So um, subsequent plugs won't be called. Um, we'll just stop there. Um, but that's not what I really want to talk about um, as much today as I do the adapter part. So as I mentioned, um, there is a cowboy adapter and a test adapter. There are other adapters available. There's an experimental chatterbox adapter, which is a HTTP2 web server. Um, there is an Eli adapter as well, which is another web server. But largely, it's, um, it's cowboy that's used. Um, so I don't know, has anyone used cowboy on its own without plug? One part, okay, you guys use Erlang, I assume. And um, has anyone done the opposite? Has anyone used plug? Have I done that one? No. Has anyone used plug without cowboy? Literally no one. Not even Peter, who? No? Fine. Um, <laughs> the other adapter is a test adapter. So that allows you to perform assertions in your tests on the response body and things. Um, so that's, you know, um, if you've used either plug.contest or phoenix.contest, then you'll have used the test adapter. And the adapter is stored on the plug.construct um, in the adapter key so that you can use it later. You normally, unless you're writing your own adapter, won't reach for this, but it is available if you need to. Um, then there are some cases that you, you may need this. Um, so this is a git log on the plug repo. And you'll see that the first commit 
um, is the initial commit, as it usually is, and then the second commit is start with cowboy support. So I think it's safe to say that when Plug was being developed, uh, it certainly had cowboy in mind, um, and cowboy will have some influence on, on the design decisions. If you're wondering how I get such nice Git logs, by the way, here's my Git config. Um, I promise this is my only Git slide, probably. So um, yeah, take a photo of that. Let's talk about Cowboy. Um, so Cowboy is an Erlang web server. Um, it's probably, um, certainly in the Elixir ecosystem, it's the most popular web server. Um, it's, it's pretty high on the list on Hex. Um, it's, uh, I think, just below Ranch and Cowlib, which are its dependencies. So if you want to make you know, the number one package on Hex, probably find something that Ranch depends on, and you'll get straight to the top. Or even better, something that Poison depends on, which is the number one. It's used in everything. So um, it's been developing for quite some time, um, maybe four or five years. And it's got two primary dependencies, um, Ranch and Cowlib. So Ranch is a TCP acceptor. Um, so that'll handle the, the communication over the TCP protocol or the SSL protocol. And the other is Cowlib, which is, um, it contains lots of utility functions that are um, web related. So you'll find things like mime parsing in there and, and header parsing and so on. So if you're writing your own web server, then you can include Cowlib as a dependency to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, I think the specific reason that it exists is to support both Cowboy and the kind of equivalent client, which is Gun. Uh, you can probably see a theme with the naming convention that the author chooses. They're all based in the Wild West. Um, I think because Apache. So, yeah. Um, Cowboy works with handlers. So a handler is um, a module that looks like this. So it has an init function. Um, and it takes a type, which is the um, type of the, H the request, so it can either be HTTP or HTTPS. Um, and then a request, uh, which would be a record from Erlang that Cowboy uses. And then you can, when you start Cowboy, you can pass it um, some options, uh, and they get passed as the third argument. And if you return OK request, and then the third argument of the tuple is the state, then Cowboy knows that the next thing it should do is call the handle function. Uh, and the handle function takes the request that you passed from init and the state that you passed from init. Uh, and then you can start doing things with the request. So um, in this particular example, I'm calling the reply function, uh, which takes four arguments. It takes the status code, which is 200 in this case, uh, a list of headers that are uh, represented as pairs, a tuple of two elements, where it's the key and then the value, um, a response body, and then the request, and then you can return that. Uh, and there's also a terminate if you want to do any cleanup. And then uh, there's this function we call called uh, in the Cowboy Router module, which is compile. Uh, and this takes a fairly simple data structure where you've got uh, the host and then a list containing three tuples with the path, the handler to be used, and <coughs> excuse me, a list of options. Um, and this returns a, a more complicated data structure, which I'll show in a second. Uh, and you pass this, uh, so Cowboy's a start HTTP function. Uh, the first argument is just a name, so I call it HTTP in this case. Uh, a number of acceptors, so that's the number of concurrent um, handlers for incoming requests. The port that you want to use, and then the dispatch that we generated earlier. So that's a hello world um, handler. What, what was that? Do I have an ex Yeah, you can see a demo. Sure, no problem. <laughs> um, so let's run the, oh, it's just off screen, hang on. Linux. There we go. Uh, so let's run the hello world. Uh, we need the no halt argument so that it doesn't terminate. This will be worth it though when you see the results. Uh, Localhost 5000. There we go, right there. So that is hello world. <laughs> wow. Easy audience, this is going to be a fun talk. Um, so if you're wondering what the compile function actually does, it takes this uh, data structure, which is a list of um, tuples that start with hosts. And you can also pass an underscore to the catch-all. So in this example, I've got foo.com as the host. And then I've got this path, which is foo, and then a required foo ID, and then bar, and then an optional bar ID. And that will go to the foo handler. And then everything else will go to the baz handler. Um, and when you call that, you get the second um, list here, which is like, a list of tuples of pairs. It's quite a complicated data structure, which is why the compile function exists. Um, you can write it out like that on your own if you want, 
but uh, I'd recommend compiling using the compile function. So um, slightly more complicated example now that uses some more cowboy functions. So this is uh, a handler that will handle post requests. Uh, in it's the same. Uh, and this time we're fetching the method from the request uh, and it returns a pair with the method and then a new request. Um, and we have a private function called handle method which returns a status code, a response string, and a request, which we'll pass to the reply function. And then we check, and if it's a post request, we will read the body, and if there's a name present, we'll say create the user um, and return a 201. Otherwise, we'll return a 422 and say there was a missing parameter. Uh, and for any other method, we'll return a 404 and say invalid method, and then the method you passed. Um, a 405 is probably more appropriate here because that's a method not allowed, but I've already, I'd already written the slides when I came to that realization, so um, it's a 404. Uh, and then we just pass these arguments in. So we've got the status, we've got the content type, um, text plane, the response string, and then two new lines. And those are important because if I was to demo this, then I didn't have those in. It would be butted up against my terminal and it wouldn't look nice. So, in fact, I'll show you. That's a good idea. So um, if I run the post example, then uh, I curl it, I put request say, then I get invalid method put because that's what we'd expect. Um, and then if I, so there's my two new line C. And then if I do a post request, it'll say missing name parameter and then I can say like name equals Gary. Gary two. Uh, and then say created user Gary. So um, again, slightly more complicated example, but, um, but nothing too, too advanced there. And I've got one more example, uh, and then I'll stop doing my silly little examples. So this is a chunked handler. Um, this calls a different function called chunked reply, which takes a status code and request. And then we send a chunk, and then we wait a second, and we send another chunk, and we wait a second, and then we return the, the response. So, and because I'm just ignoring the parameters and things, it's just a, I can do a post request here. Um, I just need to start up the server with a chunked example, and you'll see that it says hello, and then world, and then chunked. Um, so yeah, chunking. Um, so that's how Cowboy works in isolation, but um, plug, normally you, if you're using plug, you don't write these functions. Um, you call functions on plug.com. So um, when using plug with the Cowboy adapter, there are three modules in play, really. Uh, the first one is called cowboy.adapter, and it's responsible for configuring Cowboy and also starting the server. Um, so kind of what I showed at the bottom of all my slides with the start HTTP. Uh, this module here I've taken from plug, and I've deleted all the code that's related to SSL, which is most of it, to, to make it easier for, for the sake of the example. But the module does compile, and it does run plug with Cowboy. So there's an HTTP function which you can use to start the server. And it calls this run function with the same arguments. So the reason you don't call run directly is because um, in the real version, there's an HTTPS one as well, which um, calls run with HTTPS. And then the run function checks that Cowboy started and then calls kernel.apply, which uh, allows you to dynamically dispatch a function on a module. So the module's Cowboy, the function start HTTP. Uh, and then the args, um, because it's Erlang interop, we need to do a little bit of manipulation on the arguments to get in a format that Cowboy likes. So that's what this function does. Um, so in Elixir for options, we've got keyword lists, which are quite nice. Um, you can just write the keyword, colon, and then the value. Uh, but in Erlang, we don't have this. But in Elixir, um, keyword lists are implemented as lists of pairs. So with that knowledge, what's happening here is it's looking for all tuples of element size two and extracting those into one variable, which is your keyword arguments and then everything else is the non-keyword arguments. So that could be just atoms on their own. Um, if you've used Erlang term storage, you'll probably see like name table on its own alongside keyword arguments. Um, but it could be like three tuples, four tuples, uh, and so on. So they're just being split. Uh, and this allows functions from the keyword module to be applied to the, the keyword options, um, one of which is the dispatch. And this, again, just calls cowboy root or dispatch, uh, or compile, rather. And then uh, there's default arguments. And this looks quite similar to the, the other arguments. So you've got... Um, a catch-all, so it's just saying for everything, go to the, the cowboy handler and pass in the plug and the plug options. And the plug options are what get pa gets passed in it and then subsequently to call. Uh, and the handler, so this is um, 
similar to the handlers I showed earlier, um, but this is for handling requests and then taking them into plug. Uh, so this is like the entry point for requests when using plug. Uh, and it's very similar to the handlers I showed earlier, so I'll just quickly go over it. Um, instead of returning OK request and then the module name, uh, sorry, OK request and then the state, we return upgrade protocol module. Uh, and this tells Cowboy that we want to use um, its sub protocol feature. Uh, and most of the, the reason we're doing this is for error handling, so you don't get the, the Erlang error handling. We can do our own error handling here. Um, and then we, we pass through the request and then the plug options that we specified earlier. Uh, and then instead of calling the handle function, this now calls upgrade, uh, which has this additional environment uh, that's passed in as a second argument. And we call connection.con, so connection's a module. It's the um, adapters.cowboy.con module. Uh, and it has a con function, which returns a plug.con. Uh, the word con's going to have no meaning by the time I'm done with this talk, but um, that's how that works. And then it's matching to get the request out of that, so the con function returns the request, and then... We're just pattern matching this when we call. Uh, and there's a maybe send in there as well. So the maybe send um, plug allows you to set a response without sending it. So maybe send says, oh, OK, you've set your response. We haven't sent it yet, so we'll send it now. And then um, the response prepends result OK to the environment. And that's something that Cowboy deals with. And then that, it knows that the result's OK. Uh, so there's one more module. And then um, that's kind of all there is to the, the plug adapter, which is the cowboy.con module. Uh, and this is how functions are called in Cowboy from plug. Um, there's a behavior that you need to implement, which is the plug.con.adapter behavior. It takes, it has five callback functions. It used to have six. It used to have one for multi-parsing, -par for file uploads and things. Um, that's now handled by plug, so you don't need to implement it yourself. So it makes implementing adapters a bit easier. Uh, but the five functions you need to implement are send response, send file, send chunk, chunk, and read request body. Um, specifically, send response, send chunk, chunk, and read request body may seem familiar from the, the examples I showed earlier. So um, I don't have to spend ages on this because we've seen most of the code. So it implements the plug-con adapter behavior. Then this is the con function, which is the first thing it's called. So this is what I did when I fetched the method um, using Cowboy. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm just doing it a few more times with other parts, like the path and the host. Um, there are more, but I've commented them out for the sake of the slide. Um, but this returns a plug.construct with all these things available to you. And you'll see in there is the adapter, and it specifies the module and the request. Um, and that's relevant for the callbacks. So the send response implementation, it takes four arguments, um, and it calls the cowboy rec reply function, which is what we called in hello world. Um, and then it returns a three tuple, a triple, with um, OK, and then um, the second argument is the response body which isn't used by the cowboy adapter, but is used on the te test adapter, and that's how you're able to assert on the response body uh, and the original request. Send file I've stubbed, but it, um, send file is like a, an optimized way by the operating system of sending data over a socket. Um, the implementation is fairly complicated, so um, it would take a while to talk about, so I've stubbed it. Uh, chunked just does what I did in the chunked example, so it calls the chunked reply, and um, the chunk function, again, calls chunk, and read request body calls body. So you can see that there's actually not a huge amount to the interop between plug and cowboy. Um, it's quite a, a shallow abstraction. Um, Phoenix is a little bit different. So Phoenix uses a custom handler. It doesn't use the plug one. Well, it kind of does. Um, it falls back to the plug one, but it has its own handler that happens beforehand. And the way it works is in your Phoenix endpoint, you use the socket macro. Um, and then in your socket, you specify transports, and it iterates over all these and builds up a U URL that will be or a path that will be like slash socket slash web socket or slash socket slash long pole, um, and they have their own handlers, and, and it will go to those first. But for everything else, it just uses plug, uh, and that's because, as I mentioned earlier, plug doesn't support web sockets, so Phoenix has to have its own um, web socket support. Uh, you can configure the handler using the um, endpoint handler config. So if you want to write your own handler, uh, there are some use cases for this. One is maybe you're writing an adapter uh, and you want to use a different uh, WebSocket handler. So maybe you've got an existing protocol using WebSockets and you can't use Phoenix channels. Um, a custom handler is one way to kind of have your own um, protocol in use uh, before it gets to the Phoenix channels part. Or you maybe got an existing application in Cowboy and you want to go there first. There's another way to configure it as well. The dispatch that you pass in can be configured in the endpoint as well. So you could also implement it that way if you wanted, but you have to specify them all. 
because once you implement a custom dispatch, you then have to pass in all the defaults that Phoenix implements for you. Uh, but most people leave it as default and just use channels. Um, and it defaults to the Phoenix Cowboy Handler. Uh, I'm not going to show the code because it's, it's not super exciting. But let's talk about Cowboy 2. So Cowboy 2 has been in development for a while. Um, and it's, it's going to be released at the end of the summer. Um, I didn't know when summer ends, so I googled it, and it's the 22nd of September. Um, it didn't, didn't specify which summer, so uh, I assume 2018, but we know the assumptions maybe aren't, um, aren't good. So if you want to see all the changes in Cowboy, you can um, watch this talk called A Tale of 2.0 Cowboys that was at the Erlang User Conference 2017. Um, the link's at the bottom here, and it's really easy to read. Um, that's, yeah. Useful. So um, most of, well, many of the changes in Cowboy 2 are internal. Um, so it's things like uh, how it handles processes for connections. Um, but there are there are some external changes as well. They're quite minor in my opinion. Um, one of the, one of the big ones is that all the options are now maps instead of lists of pairs, uh, and the same with the headers as well. So um, for plug, um, if you want to use an existing plug application, you're going to need to at some point convert them from a list of pairs to, to a map. Um, and the same like the dispatch that you pass in, that's to be passed on a map now. And then there are some API changes as well. So uh, start HTTP is gone and there's start clear instead. Um, and you can see the arrow is changed as well. So the number of acceptors argument, which was the second argument, has been dropped. Um, you can now configure that with a branch instead. Uh, and the same with start TLS as well. So there's start HTTPS is gone and start TLS is in its place. Uh, and then other functions as well, so things like path and method that previously returned a pair with the thing that you wanted returned in the request. Since there's no side effects on the request, um, they now just return one argument, which is the path of the method or whatever it is that you're after. So that's a little bit cleaner. You don't need to keep rebinding the request. Um, and in terms of the handler, it's much cleaner as well. So before you call init and then handle, uh, now everything's handled, everything's done, performed in the init function. Uh, which just takes the request in state. So this is what the handle function used to look like. It's now the init. Uh, and the difference here, again, is that the, um, the arguments are passed as a map. Uh, and same here as well. So the env and the dispatch are passed as maps. And if we look at the diff for the, um, the adapter, uh, this is kind of a git slide. I did a git diff, so I don't know if it counts. Um, but if we look at the, uh, the init here, so the um, transport's gone. We don't have that anymore. But other than that's the same. And then instead of passing upgrade protocol module, we just pass module. And Cowboy says, oh, OK, you've passed in a module. I'll call the upgrade function on that. Um, the upgrade function's the same. And um, we've just dropped the transport, which was actually being ignored anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, so we can just call con. And um, instead of prepending the result, um, it's a map as well. So we use map.putnew. Uh, but fairly minor changes for that particular part of the upgrade. Um, a lot of the other changes were in the con where we had to change the arrays of the functions and things. So if you want to use Cowboy 2 with plug, um, there was um, a fork by Andrew Bennett, who is potato salad on GitHub. Uh, he forked plug and Phoenix as well, actually, um, to make them both work with Cowboy. And I stole his code and re-implemented it as a library so that you can um, use, plug, uh, use Cowboy 2 with plug, but not have to fork plug, so you can still get the changes to plug. Um, without having to maintain your own fork. Um, and the big difference here is when you start plug normally, um, you normally don't call the star HP. You normally add it to your supervision tree. And instead of calling the cowboy.childspec, you call cowboy2.childspec, um, and that will work. Um, OK, so that's cowboy2. Um, one of the things that cowboy2 does support is HTTP2. Um, so quick overview of HTTP2 is it's a binary protocol instead of textual. So um, if you curl a HTTP request, you'll see in plain text the, the response. But if you do it with a HTTP2 request, you won't because it's all binary. Um, you can upgrade from HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2 using a header. Um, and it supports HTTP and HTTPS, but most browsers have the requirement that you use HTTPS. So in plug and, well, in Phoenix now, when you, um, if you go into your config, it shows you how to generate the a self signed certificate for development. Um, and if you're using HTTP2 features, you'll want to use that. And then there's header compression as well. So there's like um, for two tables that are used as lookup tables. There's a lot of common headers. And when a request comes in, it'll say, oh, I know which ID that header is. I'll go and fetch it from the, the lookup table. 
Uh, and then the other part is pipelining as well. So there's a persistent connection to the server, and then streams are opened up from either the client or the server can initiate streams as well. Um, and it all handles over, uh, happens over one connection, so solves um, head of line blocking. Uh, one of the features that um, a lot of people are interested in from HP2 is server push. And server push uh, is a way for the server to say, okay, you've requested index.html, but I know you're also gonna need application.css, application.js, logo.png. So it'll just start sending these um, to the client. And then it's up to the client to say, whoa, I don't want your application.js. Um, cancel that stream. And it'll send a reset stream frame uh, and that'll cancel the request. Um, so this is most used by static assets. You know, you'll have the, the relevant assets on the page you want to serve along with it and you'll, you'll server push them and it uses the uh, push promise frame, which you can read about in the spec. So if we were to implement this for plug, um, plug doesn't have HP2 semantics, so um, we can use a different module called plug.com.h2. Uh, we can implement a push function. This is very similar to all the other functions um, in the callback uh, or in the behavior. Uh, and this one calls adapter.push, and then in our adapter we have a push function that takes the request, the path, and the headers, and then um, convert the headers to a map because Cowboy requires the headers to be in a map, and then we can call the Cowboy request push function. Um, the Cowboy request push function, if you're using HP1, just is a no-op, it doesn't do anything, and if you're using HP2, it initiates a server push. Um, the only caveat here is that you need to call it before you start sending any response, um, otherwise it'll error. And if we look at how you could use it, you can call plug.con.h2.push and then the, um, the path and the accept header. Uh, so if we have a Phoenix project, we can see uh, the page controller that's going to use this. Um, this is separate, so this will tell you on the page whether it's using HTTP2 or not. Uh, I said earlier, you don't normally have to reach for the adapter. This is one case where you can reach the adapter um, and pull out the version from the map there. So if it's HTTP2, then We'll set the HTTP2 flag to true. And then we'll have a list of assets, um, app CSS, app JS, and some images. And then we'll go over all these and call push on them. Uh, the MIME module is uh, a module that ships with plug that is used for working out the MIME types of files. Uh, and one of the ways you can work out is from the, the path, and it will return you know, application slash CSS or whatever the MIME type might be. And then we render it. So if we have a look at what this looks like, um, when I run mixphoenix.serve, you'll see it starts two, starts one on HTTP and one on HTTPS. So uh, if we go to the HTTP one, 4002, see that the page loads in slowly. I have a plug called dial-up that um, just artificially slows down the everything. And you'll see that the image is loaded in, and you'll see that they were all requested here. Uh, I'm going to bring up the inspector here, and you'll see that they were all requested individually here, and they've got their own timeline associated with them. Uh, I'll just run you through the images quickly. So, oh. so the first image is uh, a chart that I managed to sneak into the talk. Uh, the second image is the book Gary Potter and the Order, Order of the Phoenix, which is the best-selling Phoenix book available. Um, it's a really uh, convoluted name for the change log, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, here's a picture of me, Keith, and a unicorn. And then the final slide. Did me point into this slide? <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, this whole presentation has actually just been a pitch for my magic show, because um, you guys probably have no idea how I've done that. Um, it's witchcraft. <laughs> Who let me talk? So, um, if we load the same resource over HPS, though, this will be exciting. Um, you'll see that it's the same pictures, but they loaded in much faster, and then the logo comes in afterwards because it wasn't in the server push list. And it says, we know it's using HTTP2 because it says at the bottom, and I wouldn't lie to you. Uh, and we also know that the assets have been pushed because it tells us. Um, these all say that they've been pushed, so... That is um, a fairly Im simple implementation of server push and how that works. Um, so yeah, back to the slides. Okay, so yeah, this is, that works. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is um, Phoenix transports. So um, Phoenix ships with two transports by default. There is uh, a WebSocket transport, 
and a polling transport, a long polling transport. And these are used by Phoenix channels, but you can implement your own transports. Um, and the way you implement the transport is you define a module um, that implements the behavior which has a default config function on it. Um, so HTTP2 supports persistent bidirectional streams, which sounds kind of like a WebSocket. Um, so that's an ideal candidate for, um, for a Phoenix transport. Um, I gave this uh, talk as a lightning talk, by the way, at ElixirConf EU, um, called Writing an HTTP2 Adapter for Phoenix Channels. And uh, it was five minutes, um, as you can tell by the clock in the corner. And someone came up to me after the talk and said, Gary, how do you get a clock on your slides? So I was thrilled that someone really enjoyed my talk um, <laughs> and really had some key takeaways. Um, so if you want to know how to put a slide on, uh, clock on your slides, come in and uh, talk to me. It'll be fun. All right, let's look at some more code. So this is the HP2 Phoenix transport. Um, there is a Phoenix, um, Phoenix module called transport that is um, there for you to write your own transports. It has a connect function which takes many arguments, um, but the transport function will return either OK socket or an error. And if the socket it returns has an ID present, then um, you can subscribe to that channel because that'll probably be the channel for the user. Uh, and then we'll enter a loop. Um, so the loop has a ref on there, a serializer, so that'll be JSON or whatever serialization format you choose. And then we store channels and channels inverse, and that's so we can look up in either direction. So we can look up from either topic to PID or PID to topic um, and a socket. Most of this code I, I took from the long polling implementation. Um, so it looks similar to that if you've seen it. And the loop function um, has the con and the state. And most of this code at the top is to make a unique reference, um, like here, where it says make ref. And what we're doing is we're sending a message called uh, read body with a reference and um, a timeout. And then we're calling this on the PID that is responsible for the connection. And Cowboy doesn't have a way at the moment to asynchronously read a body, which is why we're sending a message. And as long as the timeout's less than, 30 sec uh, less than 60 seconds, it'll work. So after 30 seconds, this will timeout and send us a message, and we'll just continue on the loop with a new reference. Uh, so we start a receive block, and then there are two messages we can receive from Cowboy that we're interested in. One is request body fin, which means it's the end of the request body and the request has been terminated. The other is request body no fin, which means that there's more data to come upstream from the client to the server. Um, in either case, we want to handle the message that's came in. Um, but if it's a no fin, then we want to um, clear out the ref and keep looping. Um, so we want to continue execution. Uh, the other message that you can receive is a socket push, and this comes from Phoenix, uh, and this is how Phoenix sends data from the server to the client. Um, if that happens, then we'll want to um, format the reply in a way that the, the channel specification accepts, um, and then continue looping, and for everything else, we just loop. Um, when we handle an incoming message, we want to decode it um, using the serializer that's specified, um, and then we can dispatch. So this is a function that's available in the transport module as well. You pass it the message and the channels that you've got uh, and the socket, and it'll work out whether you need to send a message or just, just um, keep executing. So if it's a no reply, you don't need to do anything. You can just return OK state. Um, if you get a reply tuple with a message, then you'll want to encode a reply um, with the uh, message that came back. So if you, for example, call Phoenix join, and you want to get a reply that says Phoenix join. Um, so if you have a Phoenix channel, when you handle an in, you can optionally reply. And if you do, that will be what goes down. Um, you can also join a channel. And if, if a channel has been joined, you want to add that to your local state so that you can look it up later. Um, so that uses this private put function. Um, and if there's an error, again, you want to tell the client why there's an error. And the important thing here is that we're using cowboy request stream body. And that's how we actually send a message down to the client. Uh, and we send a no fin as well, because we're not done. Um, we want to keep going. So I have an example of this. Um, so if I start my Phoenix chat example, um, this is going to be fun where I try and match the browser up. Oh, let's just wait. Um, so my slides were formatted for a different resolution than I have available, which is why I have to 
jiggle things around a little bit. But I think I'm done. Right, so I'm going to just switch the client to long polling mode. But I can't do that because uh, JavaScript doesn't work. So I'll just open a bit more. Right, so this is the Phoenix chat example that's quite, um, that you've probably seen. So I can say uh, browser here, and then I can send messages, and they um, appear in the list. And then I can, um, so I have a Phoenix uh, channel implementation over HTTP2 that I've written a client for. So the first thing we want to do is call start link, uh, and that will return a PID, and we pass it the, the path that we're using. And then from that PID, we can open a stream, which um, is a HTTP2 stream coming from the client to the server. Um, it gets an odd number, so streams that are initiated from the client have odd numbers, and streams that are initiated from the server have even numbers. Um, if you do it the other way around, it's, it's an error. So we've got a stream, and we've got a PID. We can uh, join the channel. And then when we join the channel, you'll see that we start to get some debug information. So we have a Phoenix reply because we've joined, and we get, we're getting the pings now. Um, that's a ping. And if we also say, oh my god, it walks, um, <laughs> then you'll see that that message has appeared um, in, the, in the logs. And then if I turn the logging off because it's annoying, um, but the message is still coming in. It's just I've turned off the debug logging. But then what we can do um, that's it's even more exciting is we can send a message from the server to the browser um, using HTTP2, and it says hello from server. Um, so that is uh, an actual Phoenix transport working over um, HTTP2. I'm using Chatterbox for the client, um, which is so Chatterbox is a HTTP2 server and client. Um, it's implemented as a state machine, so uh, it was fairly easy for them to build both. Um, you, you may be thinking, well, you've said it's HTTP2, but how do I know you haven't just implemented a WebSocket client because you're probably a liar? And that's, that's a fair question, uh, and to that I say that the WebSockets are broken. They don't work at all. So that's how you know that um, I'm not using WebSockets. <laughs> um, I'll probably fix that one day. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's most of what I've done. So. Some, some things that we can do in the future with, um, with Cowboy 2 and HP2. Uh, one of the things that Phoenix does, um, it offers a static path helper. Um, so Phoenix, when it digests its assets, it generates a, a SHA on them, and then that's what's used um, when you download the asset. But you don't know what that is ahead of time, so you use the static path helper. Um, and then since you do a server push, you need to know the path, um, and then you can work out the MIME type. What we could do is whenever you call static path, we could say, OK, you, you need a static asset. Let's um, call server push on that. And then when you load the page, it will automatically push all the assets um, if you're using Phoenix. So that would be quite, quite helpful. Uh, another thing, so as I said, the, the range of adapters is quite limited. There is an experimental chatterbox adapter. Um, there is an Eli adapter. Uh, and there's the Cowboy adapter that ships with it. Uh, and now there's a Cowboy 2 adapter as well, um, which isn't compatible with the Cowboy 1 adapter. So something that would be nice, um, Ecto has lots of adapters, and it has a, like a test suite, an integration test suite, that driver developers can use um, and run all their tests against Ecto, and it'll integration test them to make sure that the adapter is compatible with Ecto and the Ecto version. So it's possible that we could write something similar for plug. So if you're developing a plug adapter, it will run a set of tests to make sure that the response body is sent correctly and the status codes and things. Um, so that's one idea I've been, I've been toying with. Um, the other thing is when Cowboy 2 is released um, before the 22nd of September, um, we'll, we'll want to include this in plug and Phoenix. Uh, I'm not sure what sort of form that's going to take yet. Um, we may want to support both. Um, and then eventually pull one of them out as an external dependency. So if you want to continue using Cowboy 1, um, then maybe we'll ship with Cowboy 2 by default, but you can include the Cowboy 1 adapter. Um, we may just not do that. I don't know. Uh, and then Phoenix as well. Phoenix will need some internal changes to handle the custom Phoenix handler for the WebSockets. Um, so I think Plug will be the easier of the two to implement. But um, the other thing I forgot to mention is that there is an example Phoenix um, so the, the repo I showed earlier with the plug to Cowboy library, there's another one called Phoenix to Cowboy, um, and that's how you can use Phoenix with Cowboy 2. So that's, uh, that's all I've got. This is me um, with a Jenga tower in my mouth. Uh, I'd like to just mention VoiceLayer, which is the company I work at. 
They, uh, a lot of the HTTP2 stuff that we've been working on um, has come from our own needs. Um, so a lot of the, the transport, for example, I, um, I built when I was working on a, a feature on voice layer. So yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Questions? No, none. Good. <laughs> you were almost safe. <laughs> that was great, thanks. Um, so it seems like there's a small amount of overlap between uh, WebSockets and HTTP2, at least as Phoenix is concerned. Uh, do you see things changing in the future? Like maybe Phoenix would use HTTP2 instead of WebSockets? So that's a good question. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the HTTP2 adapter, you'll probably, if you were paying attention, you'll notice the, the client I have on the left isn't actually a browser. Um, and that's because H2 support in the browser, um, you only get access to the features the browser lets you have access to. And you can't get access to the, the raw underlying stream. Uh -huh. So you wouldn't be able to do the bidirectional, uh, or at least not at the moment. There are some, um, some protocols being developed by the gRPC guys to um, kind of find a way of doing this in the browser. Um, there's a one called Wish that they're working on. Um, but at the, the moment, there's no way to get access to the underlying stream, so WebSockets are your best option for that. Anyone else? I can see it. I can see one. Uh, from what I've read about the whole HTTP2 push is the holy grail and everybody loves it, but equally the challenge of it is how not to push all of the assets that are in cache every time. Um, I've seen, I can't remember the name of it, there's another, not Nginx, but another web server that is quite uh, HTTP2 Caddy? support. Could be. But uh, they've started doing things like putting um, uh, cookies on to try and figure out what the client might already have so they can push the things that you might not have. Have you even started to think about how you might work that? <laughs> um, I, I have not. Um, I know that there is some, some research going on in the area. Um, and in terms of the Phoenix thing where we had the static path helper, um, you could like explicitly disable one um, if you didn't want it to be pushed at all. But in terms of toggling on a per request basis, I'm not sure the, the best way to handle that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how you would best handle that. I mean, you know who the client is, um, so you could maybe do it for like a single connection but I don't know if you could do it for, for subsequent connections um, after the connection's been dropped. And anyone else? No? Okay, good, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you.